I would make at least 18 chemical compounds. And Neem has three different names. In the Ayurvedic text, describe it. <clears throat> Remarkable healing properties as far back as 5000 BC. All parts of the Neem tree can be used for medicine, like leaves, fruits, seed, bark, roots, and oil. Uh, with specific application in medicine, cosmetics, public health, livestock production and health, agriculture, and pest control. It's believed in India that when you're chewing fresh leaf daily, it purifies your blood and strengthens your body's defense mechanism. They still sell this twigs of neem tree in India, which cut it about six inches, and uh, you have to uh, chew on it to make, to make it stray as a toothbrush, or brush your teeth, and the other end you can use knives to make it pointed as a pig, toothpick. So neem oil pressed from the seeds, perhaps the most important, because they, they have as a redact, as a direct, uh, uh, directin, directin, and uh, as a directin, nimbin, salanin, uh, some of which you might be familiar with. Uh, and this chemical nimbin for an anti-inflammatory and salanin is insect repellent asadirectin is insect repellent antifetin antihormonal and what you see this is the description of the plants and the seeds and see in the insect repellent botanical outdoors uh, gel or spray Recently, India has won 15 years old patent battle with the USA because when the U.S. scientists uh, saw this wonderful tree, they extract at least 18 compounds and patent all of them. So the Indian got very mad because they ancient plant and went to court and finally won this case. The Buddha described the origin as, of life as follows. You have to have father and mother consummate. That means you have sperm and egg because fertilization and mother are still menstruating. So she should be ovulating, obviously. So they got eggs and the womb. The egg itself has egg shell and nuclear substance. That's what they do with uh, um, cloning and so on on that. A micro environment, the egg shell is a protective environment for the chromosome in there. And macro environment is the womb. It would be a nest for the um, conceptualized egg to fertil uh, the fertilized egg to grow in there as a baby. And third part, you need a birth consciousness, which should be depend on other three factors, previous karma, consciousness, and craving. Decide to be born with that desire, so the fertilized egg. And this appeared in Mahatanha Sangyut, uh, Sut. He described the life development, life form development in the womb as follows. It starts with Kalala, like you saw previously. It can uh, fertilize egg. It's a tiny dot. It's, um, it's a smaller size than sesame seed oil, a stick on the tip of the llama hair. You have to check in at least eight times. It's as tiny as that. So basically microscopic. The second stage is a putta, a white dot, seven days later. And like a blastocyst in the current day, it's called. Then paste it, that cinch dot, and then tiny mass, kana, seven days later. And they have basaka, have five parts, one head, two arms, two legs. And finally become, uh, have hair, bodily hair, nail, kesa, lomanaka. So whatever mother consumes, fetus would thrive on such food. This is in uh, Intaka Sutra. It takes nine months to build a perfect cardiovascular system, a healthy system. And, and you live to be 75, 75 years old. If you take good care of yourself for 900 months, 3,600 weeks, or 25,200 days. But it takes a lifetime to destroy it. As you can see, now childhood obesity is a big problem in the United States. 
and more than triple in the past 30 years, the CDC reports. Currently, there are 12.5 million American kids aged 2 to 19 are obese of 17 percent of their population, which is very high. So lifespan would be shortened by obesity, hypertension, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, stroke, and heart attack. On the contrary, lifespan can be improved with weight control, exercise, not smoking, relaxation, and meditation, and early diagnosis and treatment. Obesity has been epidemic in this country. 31% we lead the world, not only our power, but also in obesity. And 60% are overweight. What happened? U.S. life expectancy now is at high as uh, at a high of 77.6 years, but the next 50 years, first reversal in life expectancy will drop by three to five years. Obesity now reduced life expectancy by four to nine months already. Look at Korea and Japan, they were very thin, only 3% obese. Obesity and longevity has been known that Obesity can cause many problems like sleep apnea syndrome, asthma, exercise intolerance, and cardiovascular cause uh, hypercholesterolemia, hypertension, coagulability problem, blood clot, and so on, and uh, chronic inflammation and endocrine dysfunction, type 2 diabetes, and so on, polycystic ovary, ovary disease in ladies, hypogonadism in male, and you got many things like arthritis, and so on, maybe lead to stroke, pseudotumor, cerebri, increased pressure in the brain, low self-esteem and depression. So uh, the Buddha advised the obese king Pasenti goes on of Saravasti, of Savati, uh, which is the largest kingdom during the Buddha's time. And the king loved the Buddha so much, he would kneel down to kiss the Buddha's feet. You know what happened? A very obese person tried to kneel down. It took a lot of effort and yeah, bowed down like that. So, out of compassion, the Buddha cited this One who is always mindful, be moderate in consumption, less is discomfort. Aging would come slower, longevity is to be expected. And the king was so smart, he noted right away and asked his personal attendant, which is his nephew, to write down immediately, jot down, and say, make sure you do recite this uh, advice every time I put food in my mouth. Shortly afterwards, he lost a lot of weight by doing so, by following such advice, feeling much better and healthier. He was so grateful to the Buddha, who gave him such advice, that given to him with immediate and long-term benefit. So he acknowledged that in Tona Pakasut. For the Buddhist monks, Theravada tradition, monk can have no solid food afternoon hours. Forbidden to save food overnight. And that in India during that time, we don't have a refrigerator twenty five hundred years ago, so food would be spoiled very easily. So that way it would prevent causing any illness as well as uh, to be moderate in consumption, not overindulge with too much food. So walking also adds healthy years to life. It's been shown that walking 30 minutes a day adds 1.3 healthy years and 1.1 uh, more years without cardiovascular disease. If you walk under more than 30 minutes in a high physical activity level, you gain 3.7 years of life and add 3.3 more years without cardiovascular disease. And walking is also associated with reduced risk of dementia. Buddha also described the benefit. He advised monks to do walking meditation, to be mindful aware of yourself while you're moving your body. Again, observe your body, see mind. And the benefit of walking meditation, endure a long journey, it improves your perseverance and being healthy because you exercise just like they do in modern day and good digestion 
like when you walk, your intestine would rub against each other and cause your bowel to move properly, passing gas and so on. It's very, very good, very good for people who underwent surgery for the post up care. That's why they encourage patients to get up and walk around after uh, surgery. So that way they keep uh, being healthy, not getting blood clot and so on. And uh, when you walk, walking meditation lead to samadhi, a better, long-lasting, steady samadhi of the mind, or steady mind. Buddha described good and bad patient uh, as follow. Bad patient are difficult to take care of. One, doing things that would harm oneself. Two, overindulging. Three, not taking medicines. Four, not telling the symptoms truthfully. Uh, whether one's improving, worse, or stable. Five, not enduring pain, but rather commit suicide than bearing the pain. Good patients are the opposite, doing things that would make oneself healthier, healthy, to no one's limit in, cons in consumption. Three, taking medicine. Four, telling symptoms truthfully. And five, endure pain. Good and bad doctors and nurses who should not take care of or treat a patient. One cannot prescribe proper treatment for the illness. And two, cannot differentiate uh, beneficial from harmful, di harmful diet and uh, prescribe the wrong food for the patient. Three, expecting reward and lack of loving kindness. And four, hate to clean up stool, urine, vomitus, sputum. And five, not knowing how to comfort or encourage patients with a pep talk at times. Good doctors and nurses are the opposite. They can prescribe proper treatment, can differentiate uh, what is the right food and harmful diet. Like you don't prescribe a high cholesterol diet for people that have high cholesterol already. Like eating too much egg or dairy product would be harmful to them. Encourage them to do more vegetarian diet. And three, treating patients with love and kindness without expecting rewards. And four, do not mind cleaning up the mess. And five, explain and guide and comfort with pep talk at times. So the Buddha was given a simile to a physician on this basis of the Four Noble Truth. He made the diagnosis as the cause of suffering based on the symptoms of suffering. And he can root back to the cause of it, which is the mind reaching out with, with desire, liking or disliking, or tanha, craving. And then he gives you a treatment, a prognosis, treatment with the middle path that might see might clearly, uh, no effort path, that will result in the end of suffering, with the pro right prognosis. So, why do we need to do so? Because we in thought all the time, a sneaky thought, which is basically based on space and time. Thought based on your memory, the past, and make you dream to the past or into the future, based on the knowledge you have learned. Thought and concept always deal with time, kala, and space, tesa. They're not pure perception, not uh, sanja parisati, nor is a direct experiencing, sava sangvedana. It's not my full awareness, no sati and sampachanya, but being conditioned by one biased thoughts, sneaky thought, sanja chetana. Basically, Buddhism differentiate, make a dis distinction between conceptual phenomena, which is based on thoughts and so on, give rise to a sneaky thoughts, and to versus ultimate reality, direct experiencing. You come to witness the ultimate reality of my mental activities, which are feeling, perception, thought formation, form, and nirvana, the ultimate reality of life. In meditation, the great master like Rompo Thien would cite this following, one suffers of our own thoughts, and past is gone, do not in Longing for the past thoughts or past events, 